Well, every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., just outside my office, I join with the other elders and we get on our knees and we pray for you, pray for our church family, we pray for the community. One of the things I started doing a few months ago is I'd get on social media early Tuesday morning, like 5, 5.30 when I first wake up, and I would post a, um, a question. I'd say, hey, how can we as elders pray for you this morning? And the responses back are direct messages, like nobody else can read them, I read them. And of the thousands of responses that I have received over the months for prayer requests, it strikes me how significant it is that a large percentage of them are directly connected to marriage in a way that surprised me, all kinds of them. You pre, please pray that God would save our marriage. Teenager says, please pray that my parents would stop fighting, that they wouldn't get divorced. My wife's moved out, please pray that she'll give us another chance. My husband won't come to church with us. Would you pray that he would come to church with us? Just one prayer request after another. What strikes me though, isn't just the percentage, it's the profile picture that the request is next to. That probably doesn't surprise you, but oftentimes those very desperate requests for help are next to a profile picture of a couple, cheek to cheek, all smiles, looks like everything is good, but they're really struggling. And if you've been married for very long, the chances are you know that dynamic. You know what that's like where you're trying to figure things out and you're just not sure if you know what you're doing and you're going through a season where it's especially challenging and yet... A lot of people don't know it. And I'm just convinced that within our church and within our community and in our country, we're in a season where there are a lot of people who are struggling in their marriage and they really need help and they're not sure how to talk about it or where to turn or what to do. And so for the next number of weeks, we're talking about marriage because I think there are a lot of people who are hurting. If you look at the search results of what people search for online that leads them to our website or leads them to a sermon on our website, and you look at the top 10 Searches, eight out of the top 10 searches are somehow related to marriage. How can God save my marriage? My marriage is in trouble. How can I I be reconciled to my spouse? Just one after another. And so we wanna talk about this because I think it's an, an area of hurt right now. I've told a story before about taking my son to Colorado and he was skiing first day, broke his clavicle. What I haven't told you is what happened after that. The ski patrol comes, they cut his shirt off. It's freezing out. So he's bare chested and cold, got a broken bone. They ski him down to the bottom of the mountain where there's this um, ER type of space. We're waiting for some help. He's in pain and he's cold. Just just give the boy some pain medicine and, and a blanket would be great but we're, we're waiting. They gotta figure out how insurance works and how much we're gonna pay versus how much insurance is gonna pay. And, and then the nurse finally comes in to talk to us and the nurse begins with a little bit of a lecture. I think that's what I'd call it, making both of us feel bad for the fact that he's in pain. Like if you would just ski within your limits and here's the safety instructions that you should have received. And you know, the conditions out there right now are pretty difficult. A lot of ice on the, on the mountain during this time of the year. And I'm like, okay, can we just get some pain medicine? Is that, can we start with that in a blanket and then we'll listen to the little lecture? But he's in a lot of pain right now. Doctor comes in, pretty chatty for a doctor, wants to talk to us about clavicle. Like uh, explains to us, clavicle comes from a Latin word that means uh, little key. All right, could you just get him some medicine? Could we, could we do that? It's also called the beauty bone. I don't, I don't care, I, I don't care. He's cold and he's hurting. Could we do something about that? I'm not that interested in the etymology of clavicle. And I think that's what some people experience when they come to church. Like they've got this pain and that they're they're dealing with. And they've tried a lot of other things. And they didn't really wanna try church, but after trying a lot of other things, they decided to come to church. And then they sometimes sit through a lecture that makes them feel bad about the pain that they're in, but offers very little hope about what to do next. What they need is some medicine and a blanket. They need, they need some hope from Jesus, but what they get is some guilt and some shame and they end up walking out in more pain and a little bit colder than they were when they walked in. Or, or, or they come in and they listen and they're like, okay, so the, the etymology is interesting. A word study, that's fascinating. But I just need some help with my marriage right now and I'm just convinced that there are a lot of people in our church and our community, community that that's where they're at. Like they're struggling 
and they need some help. They're not sure what to do, but they just need somebody to give them some pain medicine and a blanket. And so this series, in part, is about that, that there are a lot of couples that are struggling, and, and Jesus, Jesus loves you, and he cares about you, and he wants this to be a place where you can come and, and you can get help, where you can know you're not alone. And, and so that's part of the reason for this series. But another reason we're doing a four-week series here, and this is important, is that marriage is unique in that it was meant to be, designed by God to be a covenant that could be pointed to as a illustration, as a picture of what God wants to have with his people. Like marriage was meant by God to be a covenant that showed the world the kind of covenantal love that he has for his people. And so you see this throughout scripture. Hosea chapter two is a good example of how this picture, this metaphor gets used where God says, I want to make you my spouse forever, showing you righteousness and justice and unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine and you will finally know me as the Lord. And so God's pointing to marriage as a picture of the kind of relationship, the kind of grace that he has for us, the kind of unconditional committed love that he has for his people. And we see this even in Revelation. At the end of Revelation, we are united with other believers, with Jesus, and we sit down for a great feast. And that feast is called the wedding feast of the lamb. That picture is consistent throughout scripture. When Paul in Ephesians is talking about the union and the intimacy of marriage, he says, look, I'm not just talking about marriage here. Well, it feels like you are. It feels like that's all you're talking about. No, no, no. I I am talking about marriage, but it's not just about marriage. I'm also talking about a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about Jesus and and you. And I want you to hear that in these next few weeks. We're talking about marriage and God's plan for marriage, but we're not just talking about marriage. We're talking about Jesus and you. We're talking about Jesus and the church. And so this is one of the reasons Why God in Malachi says, I hate divorce. Now listen, he does not say, I hate people who've been divorced. He does not say that. And if the church has made you think that he says that, over the years, maybe your church tradition or background, I want you to know that is not true. God loves you. You are not just wanted here. You are welcomed here, open-armed. We're so glad that you're here. But God hates divorce for the, science, for the same reason my buddy whose daughter was diagnosed with cancer hates cancer. He hates divorce. God hates divorce because he loves you. But it's not just that. God also hates divorce because it, it is contrary to the covenant that he wanted when he created marriage. Like he wants to be able to point to marriage within the church and say, this is, this is, this is what I had in mind. Not, not just for husbands and wives within the church, not just for husbands and wives who are followers of Christ, but this is what I had in mind for you and me. That the world would be able to look at marriages within the church and not just understand, here's how it works best because God designed it and created it, but they could look with marriages in the church and say, oh, that's how God loves me? God loves me with that kind of grace? God loves me with that kind of affection. God loves me with that kind of forgiveness. God loves me with that kind of joy and unselfishness. And so for that reason, we spend a little extra time on it, not just because we wanna have healthy, happy marriages, but because it's a picture of what God has in mind for us and him. Last week we saw in Matthew 19, when when Jesus is asked questions that are meant to trap him, meant to cancel him. He's asked questions about men and women and marriage and divorce. And and what Jesus does is he points back to God's original design in Genesis. We saw this last week. To understand this, you have to understand that the first century was every bit as immoral and as depraved as our culture in parts of the world even more so. But the way Jesus responded to that brokenness in that culture, to the confusion in that culture, the way he responded to it was not necessarily to get caught up in all their drama, but to point them consistently back and say, look, look, haven't you read this? 
Haven't you read that from the beginning, this is what God wanted for men and women for marriage. Like this is the way he designed it. This is the way it's supposed to be. And he just consistently points people back to the beginning. Here's God's, here's God's plan. And so in, in a world where there's a lot of brokenness and confusion, in a world where we're not always sure how to respond when there's so much talk about relationships and sexuality and and especially in a month like this, we're just like, well, what's the right response? The question is, what is the Jesus response? And here's what you see in the gospels that Jesus responded first with compassion and clarity. Compassion and clarity, Matthew 19. Have you not read from the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. He's compassionate and he's clear. And then when children are involved, Jesus responds with protection and warning. Luke chapter 17, verse two, Jesus says, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea and a millstone tied around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And so you see Jesus compassionate and clear. You see Jesus protective and warning when children get involved. And so the question for us is what's the Jesus response? And I would just say, ultimately, there's no better response than a church where people who are, having a hard time in marriage, can come and find hope and healing. No better response than healthy, happy families. And so I, I know, look, I know that a lot of you are single and you're like, okay, so four weeks on marriage, am I, so I do, do I get a pass? Uh, for, I, like, I, I hope you'll see it differently for a few reasons. One, that what we talk about in this series applies largely to every relationship. Like we're taking princi relational principles in scripture and we're applying it to marriage, but you can apply it to pretty much any relationship. That, that, the exception of that would be week three when we're talking through sexuality. But the truth is that all of us, married, single, like all of us are so indoctrinated with different World, world's perspective on sexuality that we all need to be reminded, okay, this was God's plan. This is what God, God had in mind. And besides all of that, I, I hope, you know, if you're single, that it'll be a time for you to think about these things. Like if you want to be married before you get married, <laughs> like, it, like you, it would be hard to get married couples to agree on like a hundred married couples to agree on anything. But I would say, that 100% of married couples would agree with this statement, the best time to work on your marriage is before you get married. Like that's the best time. Like you don't wanna open up the driver's manual when you're behind the wheel. Like, you know, like when you're driving down the road, it's not the time to break that out and see how it's supposed to, to work. Like you wanna do that before you start driving. And so I, I hope it'll be helpful for those reasons. The title of the series is The Generous Marriage. And the more I've studied the love of God, the more I think it's, um, it's so clear what makes his love distinctive is he's so generous, y'all. He is so generous. And if our love for one another in marriage is meant to be a reflection of God's love for us, then at the foundation should be generosity. A generous marriage. We see this in the most well-known Bible verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Or the NLT puts it this way. For this is how God loved the world. He gave. He demonstrated his love through sacrificial generosity. So when we love one another that way, we are modeling the kind of love that God has for us. This radical generosity. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10 that when Jesus came, he said of himself, for the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to what? Give. Give his life sacrificially as a ransom for many so that when we love one another that way as husband and wife, we are reflecting the sacrificial love of Jesus. And, and so we wanna put that into practice. Somebody put it this way. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And I think that's really helpful. And that's what God demonstrates for us. Now, when we talk about generosity, typically we talk in terms of money. The reason for that is it is the primary application of generosity in scripture. So when I speak of being generous, the natural tendency is to think in terms of money. And yet what I would tell you is that being generous, just one application of it is finance, right? Like a generous life is demonstrated in many more ways than just what you do with your money. And so what I wanna do is, is look at marriage, look at some of the promises and the wisdom of generosity through this, this lens of, of marriage. Let me give you an example of this. Proverbs 11, 24, 25. 
One person gives freely, yet gains even more. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Like one, one person is generous, but has more to show for. Another person withholds unduly. They're like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be generous because I don't wanna lose what I have, but they come to poverty. A generous person will prosper and the one who refreshes others will be refreshed. So this is general wisdom literature here where God says, this is the way it generally works. If, if you are going to give generously, you'll experience a mystery that's a little hard to explain, and, but in your generosity, you end up receiving more than you gave. I, I can tell you, as a, uh, personally and as a pastor, that sounds weird, but I've seen it enough that I'm like, well, yeah, no, I believe that. Like, I know that that's true. And I would just say that that applies to more than just being generous with your money. It applies to how you are with your spouse. A few years ago, there was a study done by the University of Virginia and they were trying to identify the different factors that make a couple very happy. They had a number of categories that they tested hundreds of couples in, and, and they were surprised to find that the, the most significant category that determined a very happy marriage was what they called their generosity scale. That the higher a couple ranked on the generosity scale, the more likely they were to be very happy in their marriage. And they're generous with one another. You've seen studies like this before where things like, um, you know, the equation of five positive interactions for every one negative one makes for a very happy marriage. But that's just, that's just a generosity equation of five for every one. And, and so they discovered that this generosity is a much more significant factor than perhaps has been understood. Here's how they defined a generosity in the study. The virtue of giving good things to your spouse freely and abundantly. And, and don't, when you see things, don't just think in terms of like, um, you know, objects for purchase, like it's attention, affection, time, the, the, the virtue of giving good things, encouragement, service to your spouse freely and abundantly. And when I read this, I thought, well, that's a decent definition biblically. Take the word freely here as an example. The Bible helps us understand that generosity is, is giving without an expect expectation of getting something in return. And so we could define it this way, a generous marriage gives without expectation. And so this is hard for us. <laughs> like we are discipled culturally to think of our relationships in a transactional way. I do for you, you do for me. If you're not doing for me, you start doing for me, then I'll think about doing for you. If, if you're not doing for me, you make a down payment of doing, and then I'll think about doing something for you. Like, I, you meet my needs, I'll meet your needs. If you're not gonna meet my needs, why would I meet your needs? Like, we're just discipled to think of relationships. What, what's in it for me? And that is opposite of the heart that God has for, for marriage. That kind of selfishness is a violation to the oneness and intimacy that's described for us in scripture. And, and so... When we love in this generous way that's free, free without expectation, what we're doing is we're showing the world this is how God loves us. Romans chapter five, verse eight, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, that God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He sent Jesus, he gave Jesus while we were still sinners. The message paraphrases it. God sent Jesus when we didn't have anything to offer him in return. That's when he demonstrated his generosity to us. And so when we do that in marriage, we're showing the world, this is how God loves. This is how God gives. Second Corinthians 9, 7 says that when we give, we shouldn't give reluctantly or under compulsion. And here's why. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves someone who gives with a smile on their face. Like that's the way he gives. That's the way he wants us to give. Not because there's this compulsion or this obligation. We give freely, we give cheerfully. And we'll talk more about this in a few weeks, but I'll just say that for, for some of you, you're making it nearly impossible for your spouse to give freely because you're being demanding and entitled. And when you're demanding and entitled, you're robbing them of the opportunity to give free. There's no opportunity for generosity if you're in a relationship where it's constant demands and entitlement. You can't be loved that way and they can't love that way. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks.